of students, uh, even though they are very well known uh, uh, experts and, and writers on Brexit and, and UK matters. So I'm sure you, you know them already. Uh, after having said a few words, I was saying I will give them the floor uh, for about 20 minutes each to uh, tell us uh, what they are uh, uh, thinking and, and writing on about the impact of Brexit on the UK uh, political system. After the two presentations, I will leave the floor to the students, uh, first and foremost, for a Q&A uh, session where we will have the time to wrap up and, and, and discuss uh, uh, this, the several topics uh, uh, which we dealt uh, with in this, in this first day. Professor Gianfranco Baldini uh, teaches at the University of Bologna, is an associate professor. Uh, he has been uh, the author or the editor of many books uh, on uh, uh, the UK political system, for instance, uh, uh, we're not talking on uh, the coalition, or uh, more recently, this book uh, by Il Mulino, La Gran Bretagna dopo la Brexit, is um, a member of the scientific board of Istituto Cattaneo and uh, an executive, a, a member of the executive board of the new Rivista Il Mulino. Uh, I hope executive board is, 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 is the correct way to put it. Um, professor uh, Frosini is instead an associate uh, professor at Bocconi uh, uh, University. He's also an adjunct professor of constitutional law at the Johns Hopkins University in, in Bologna, and there is director of the Center for Constitutional Studies and Democratic uh, Development. He's also uh, uh, someone who has written at length uh, about uh, the UK and about uh, Brexit. He has uh, written, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have here uh, a paper copy, so you can see perhaps on my mobile is a recent book, is a recent monograph, uh, entitled Dalla sovranità del Parlamento alla sovranità del popolo, la rivoluzione costituzionale della Brexit for CEDA 2020. So they are both uh, uh, written, or I guess in the case of Gianfranco, are writing a book on, uh, on Brexit and the UK political system. Without further ado, really, uh, I'd like to give them the floor, uh, going strictly in alphabetical order, I'll go first uh, with Gianfranco and then with Justin Frosini. Uh, Gianfranco, uh, if you want to share slides, uh, please feel, feel free uh, or uh, as you wish. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, okay. If, uh, many thanks for the invitation. And uh, it's, it's a very good opportunity for me to discuss some of my work. I would just uh, actually like to ask you, Eduardo, sorry for not doing this before, if you could please put uh, the slides uh, that I sent you yesterday, yes, uh, because I, I'm not very familiar with this kind of system, because as, as most of you probably know, each university has its own Teams, Zoom and whatever device to, to teach now, so sorry for this. And um, I, will, I will speak about my own research on the, um, on the impact of Brexit on the UK party system. Because, and, and I'm glad I was able to hear at least some of, of Giuseppe Martinico's presentation before, and it was very useful because, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to, to listen to all of it because I had another call, unfortunately, but uh, um, I remember uh, listening to Giuseppe talking about the, the political constitution. So you're already familiar with a key concept on which political scientists do approach uh, the, the, the constitutional issues in the UK. And today I would like to say a few things uh, by using also some data that I'm using together with Professor Bertanelli and Professor Emanuele Massetti of the University of Trento uh, in, a, in a forthcoming book that we are trying to, to complete right this month. And so uh, our aim in this book is exactly to try and uh, see the first effects of Brexit on the political system. And my own angle in, in, in particular is to look at the party system, which is, of course, a very important component of the political system, because in a political system such as the UK, the UK's is clearly important to uh, be in power in order to try or to be able to reform the constitution, because as, as we know, as you know already, uh, and constitutional change can be approved also by a simple majority party. And what we know now in, in basic terms and 
about the UK political system is that this has been associated with the concept of a majoritarian system or a Westminster model. And therefore, in, in our work, we do use the, the, the model as developed by the Dutch and now American political scientist, Arne Leibert, who was able to come up already in the 1970s and early 1980s with one of the most used classification of models of democracy. And in his model, uh, uh, the, the UK used to be the prototype of this uh, majoritarian or uh, Westminster democracy. And in such a democracy, um, there are a few points which are clearly very important, again, to be uh, considered uh, when one wants to understand also the impact of, of, of an event and of a process such as the Brexit process. And the, so um, Bar Leipert lists uh, a number of variables. I don't have all of them with me, but two of them are important for my research. And the two of them are the one related to the, uh, to the party system as such, and the other is related to the electoral system. And the, the understanding being that uh, the majoritarian, or to, to speak it more properly, the plurality electoral system, the first past the post, the majoritarian system, which is applied in single member constituency, is a key cornerstone of that political model. And therefore, uh, until the plurality is applied, uh, there is a key safeguard for the major parties from the challenges coming from minor parties. So if we may look, please, at, at, at slide number one, at, at table number one, this is a table that I'm, that I'm using uh, in, in our common work with, with Eduardo and Emanuele, in order to show that some changes in the British political system and party system preceded Brexit uh, uh, in, in a very important way. So when we talk about the Westminster model, this is the first point I want to make. We talk about the classic model, which is here in column number one, which is a, a system which only basically lasted the first 25 years after 1945, a system whereby you can see it in the in the, in the row about two-party vote, more than 90% of the British electoral, electorate did uh, vote for one of the two main parties. So this was a pillar of the Westminster model, and thanks to the, to the application of the plurality system, this uh, meant that each of the two main parties, Conservatives and Labour, were able to gain a self-sufficient majority in Parliament, which turned their a relative majority of votes into an absolute majority of seats. So these parties in a system like the British system are very powerful and they can change the constitution if they want. Okay, So they haven't changed it for a long time, but then troubles came. And this is one of my aim of, of the table that I'm showing you is to see the extent to which the Brexit years, which are here covered by the two last elections of 2017 and 2019, which were already mentioned by Giuseppe in his previous present presentation, actually show some return to a more classic two-party system, but with important differences. So this is my, my second point is the following then. We had a classic model, which was based on uh, uh, trust, which was based on deference on the main parties, which was based on the perception that the UK political system was a sort of a model of democracy, and this provided in the, indeed for many other um, countries a sort of benchmark in order to gain accountability and to gain a, a better stability of the political system. And these were uh, recognizable also in a very low level of volatility and in a, in, a, in a very high number of seats, which were marginal seats, to use this term, which identified very closed races between the two main parties. So it was a two-party game, basically, in those 25 years. But it was only those 25 years, because changes started to appear already in the 1970s, with the rise of minor parties, with the troubles in Northern Ireland, with inconclusive elections in 1974, with many changes that preceded Brexit. At that time, as you have heard already from Professor Martinico, the UK was entering in the, in the European economic community. It was troubled country in economic terms because the 1973 crisis was very important for the UK and many other things, important things. So what we see in this uh, time, which I've called the rise of minor parties, is that the indicators that you saw in the classic model 
do change importantly. So the combined vote for the two main for the two main parties goes down, volatility almost doubles, and there are new parties. This is what is represented by regeneration and identification with the two main parties collapses from 45 to 16, and it would never recover back afterwards. Okay, so we are talking about changes again, which were actually in place long before Brexit was even thought about. Okay, so Brexit starts to become a perspective, if you want, after the Master Treaty, when, when UKIP is formed, when the Anti-Federalist League first is formed and then UKIP is formed. And then there are other electoral shocks, not my, in, my invention as a term, but it's the concept that the British um, election study uses to identify other important changes, which again, precede Brexit. What are these changes? Four of them are identified by the British election study. I will not talk about uh, all of them, but just in a nutshell, uh, the rise of UKIP is again important, you know, and it comes also as a major rise um, thanks to the application of a proportional electoral system in European uh, uh, Parliament elections since 1999. Okay. Then there is the question of the financial crisis, which is also very important. Third, is the coalition government that Eduardo was mentioning before um, the book I edited with Jonathan Hopkin on, on the coalition government, you know, with, with David Cameron and, and, uh, and uh, Nick Clegg uh, back in 2010. And finally, uh, the Scottish referendum. Again, another important referendum, which uh, was, again, uh, you know, impossible to conceive just 10 years before it was held, because basically what the, the Labour Party did by the, with devolution was to try to uh, still uh, to kill nationalism stone dead. This was an expression that was chosen by a minister of the Blair government. Of course, what happened, what we have seen is that the opposite happened. And therefore, the political system of the UK was experiencing many troubles already before Brexit. So what's the effect of Brexit? Of course, when we want to comment the last column of this table, we need to be aware of the fact that uh, a postdoc doesn't mean proctor. And so it's not the case that we can attribute to Brexit all the changes that we can identify uh, in this table. So, but still, the, the, the picture that you get from this, I think it's worth reflecting. So we do see that fragmentation goes down and the two main parties actually gain more votes as compared to the previous two phases. We see that, however, volatility is still very high. So British citizens, not as much as the Italian ones, but still uh, a lot more than they were before 1970s, are not identifying stay in a stable way with the same party for years or decades, as it was the case before. Uh, and so uh, regeneration, which is again the, 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 the data that I didn't comment specifically, which is due to uh, electoral volatility related to the rise of new party, is still very much higher than in the first two phases, although lower than in the third one. And again, as I said before, party identification is very low and marginal seats are also uh, much lower than in the first phases of the classic Westminster model. This proportionality, interestingly enough, is back to the same data, to the same uh, number that we had in the classic Westminster model. However, I don't have time to elaborate on this, but in a nutshell, again, this proportionality is, of course, was lower in the first phase because the two parties combined got you know more than 90% of the votes, so that is, there was no need of a big bonus to get a majority for the winning party. But this proportionality is also related to electoral geography, so it depends on which party is actually able to gain a specific a, a seat in a specific constituency. But the 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 end point you know and uh, uh, about this data is that of course. The British political system has changed after the 2016 referendum, but the, the, the changes that we can document here are those that we can say, you know, are still in search for a clear explanation. Because what we can say is that as some opinion polls have told us that people were more confident in, in Boris Johnson after Theresa May wasn't able, as we've heard again from Martinique before. To actually get Brexit done, as it was the expression of the, you know, of the 2019 slogan of the Conservative Party, and so 
the, the two-party format is not back to the same level of the classic Westminster model. However, in a quite uneven way, because the Conservatives were clearly better in achieving their own with their results in 2019, there are some signs of a reconsolidation of a two-party system. So if I may ask, please, Eduardo, again, to turn to the next slide. This is my final point I want to make. Um, I'm sorry because I will not be able to comment all these points, but in a nutshell, again, my argument here is that to understand our party system changes, we always need to take into account that this is a combination, it's an intertwining, it's a bundling up, uh, as, as Giuseppe was saying before, of different factors some social, some party factors, and some institutional factors. Let me start by these last factors, which are, in my opinion, uh, very important, although not the only important ones. By institutional factor, I basically mean the survival of the plurality system. Until the plurality system is applied, uh, main political parties will be able to face minor challenges. If these challenges, of course, become more important, they might be perceiving some threat, they might be losing seats, but this will ultimately, in the perception of the voters, they will have the so-called mechanical and psychological, especially psychological factors that Maurice Duverger already identified back in the 1950s as a key element, you know, to, to foster a two-party system. So plurality is a bulwark of a two-party system. If plurality is reformed, of course, there can be some room combined with other external shocks, so it's my bottom line in the second column, uh, there could be some room for substitution. So what do I mean by substitution? Substitution is, I borrowed this from uh, uh, Catherine de Vries and Sarah Orbot's uh, last book on uh, politics, and they basically say substitution is a major change of the party system whereby the two main parties basically the main establishment parties, as they call it, as they call them, collapse, and the, the party system experiences a big change. Fragmentation would be uh, somehow the continuation of a state of quo, or rather the continuation of the second and third phases that I have identified in my previous slide, and the reinvention would mean the capacity of the two main parties to learn the challenges that they have been you know, facing over the last decades or so. So again, I'm not able to comment on all these cells, but if you want, I'll be very happy to come back on these. So in a nutshell, again, what I mean by fragmentation is that there could be some trouble for the two main parties if the Brexit issue is not completely reabsorbed. If, you know, as you know from the deal, yeah, you might have already talked about this, or I'm sure you would do this in the next days. If the deal that was approved on, uh, on Christmas, uh, uh, on Christmas Eve uh, a few months ago, you know, leaves many sectors open to politicization. The finance sector, the fisheries, there are many sectors that have not been ruled in an exact and definitive way. So is this going to be an issue along which new maverick parties can have their own success? We do know, for instance, that the Brexit party did not completely disappear after Brexit was done. So it has now a, a, a a new uh, instantiation in, in a way is called the Reform UK, if I remember well. And this party is actually as the possibility of, you know, uh, coming back as a maverick party. However, we should also not forget that the UK will no longer take part in European Parliament election. And this is a key factor along which both UKIP and the Brexit party were very successful as challenger parties. Um, fragmentation also depends on the success of the two challenger parties, the Lib Dems first and the Scottish National Party, uh, that were able to um, steal, so to speak, seats or to gain seats from the two major parties, first the Lib Dems and then the SNP. To what extent these two parties are going to be able to gain seats in the next election? Of course, nobody knows, but we know that if there will be another Scottish referendum and if Scotland leaves the UK, of course, this might mean, although this is again very difficult to make any forecast, and uh, it might mean that the two main parties, the Conservatives and Labour, will no longer have you know, the challenge of the SNP, which has been able to 
conquer most of the seats in the Scottish, most of the Scottish seats, especially in the 2015 and 2017 UK elections. So I see my time is over. Apologies for being a bit, uh, uh, for running a bit in my explanation with my first intervention. I'm more than happy to come back on any of, the, of these aspects. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. To and I also um, apologize to, to Beppe for the fact that I was unable to sit in on his uh, uh, previous uh, talk due to, due to other engagements. Uh, unlike uh, Gianfranco, I'm uh, not going to even try to upload any slides because I would certainly do something disastrous. So uh, I will uh, uh, just uh, cover some, some points that I think are, are extremely salient from a constitutional constitutional point of view. Of course, it's not by chance that Eduardo, Beppe and so on have chosen Gianfranco and myself to, uh, to discuss uh, various issues in this roundtable, because obviously Gianfranco has given you uh, the position, very important uh, position of a, of a political scientist. I will try to look at all of this from the point of view of a comparative constitutionalist, although I think both of us are of the opinion that there is a lot of overlap between our two our two fields of study. Um, what I'm interested in, and what I've tried to address in the last few in the last few years with various uh, publications, uh, including the uh, book that Eduardo very kindly uh, referred to uh, in his uh, in his introduction, is the effects that Brexit has had on uh, the British uh, constitutional uh, system, and. Of course, we could go back much further. I do that in my book, uh, looking at sort of the uh, roots uh, and causes of, of, of what happened in 2016, uh, using uh, the H. Cars, uh, the historian E.H. Cars theory of causation and so on. This is something that we can maybe uh, come back to, but given we have 20 minutes and as always, Gianfranco is like a Swiss, a Swiss watch or clock. He was perfectly punctual. I cannot being half British go over my time. So I will just bring up the points, basically starting just before uh, the referendum in 2000, uh, 2016, to underline what I think and what I have def defined uh, in a editorial for the Italian Journal of Public Law, the rips uh, in the unwritten Constitution of the United Kingdom. This might sound of kind of a kind of a paradox or an oxymoron, uh, given that we talk about the fact that the British Constitution is unwritten. In actual fact, it would be more precise to say that it is an uncodified constitution, which also includes uh, written parts to it. Uh, but we have had uh, a series of, of of rips in this constitution, in my opinion. Now let's start with the with the referendum itself. Now, some scholars would argue that given the uh, importance and the prevalence of a parliamentary uh, form of government, let us not forget the United Kingdom is often referred to as the cradle of parliamentary uh, of the parliamentary system, that the referendum is something that is totally incompatible with uh, a parliamentary form of government. For example, we just have to look at comparatively the Germans would would uh, certainly agree with this. Indeed, uh, that institute is not foreseen at all in the German parliamentary system. However, that's one point where we have had to uh, concede uh, that uh, referendums, although uh, defined many years ago by a former conservative uh, minister, Francis Pym, as an unknown beast in the British system, since the early 1970s, we have had uh, referendums being held in the uh, the United Kingdom. We had, of course, a referendum in 1975 to decide whether Britain should stay in the uh, European Economic Community only two years after it had uh, entered the, uh, the common market, which in my opinion is testimony of the difficulties that we have always had in the relationship between Britain and Europe. Uh, the referendum in 2016 as such was not a break with the uh, with the British constitutional system. Okay. Um, however, uh, two things that are very important to underline are the fact that, and this I'm sure was underlined in Beppe's uh, talk and that you're all familiar with, the referendum was not legally binding 
this should be underlined and this is this is something that i want to uh, i want to point out further uh, maybe also in the in the in the q and a and uh, secondly in a way from a constitutional point of view that referendum had to take place because it was something that was contained in the manifesto of the uh, Conservative Party at the elections of 2015, which were unexpectedly won by the party. And uh, this uh, obviously means, I hope you can hear me, you seem to be having some, okay, right, right, okay, sorry. Um, this meant that uh, once, the, once the Conservative Party had won the two, 2015 elections, Gianfranco and others will remember that this was for many people a surprise. Personally, for me, it wasn't. I thought that the Conservatives would win in 2015. At that point, they were obliged to hold a referendum. So there, no particular issue. The problem, however, is uh, with there are two issues, one substantive and one procedural, in my opinion, where we have rips with the Constitution. The procedural issue is that in holding the referendum, Cameron and the government did not bear in mind the fact that the United Kingdom is a multinational state, to use a definition that has been used by the UK Supreme Court and by others. We have, we have had devolution since 1997-1998. OK, Britain is a very different place with respect to what it was in the 1980s or earlier. And therefore, in a logic, and I'm sure in particular Beth as a comparative constitutionalist would agree with this, as a devolved system, the referendum should have had a double threshold. In other words, not only should there have been a majority of the population of the United Kingdom in favour of the referendum, but there should have been a majority of the constituent nations of the UK in favour of uh, leaving uh, the EU or obviously staying in the EU. And this is what has led today to the by many that uh, uh, the United Kingdom may have its days counted and that the union uh, may uh, dissolve due to the fact that in the referendum, as you all know, uh, England and Wales voted in favour of leaving the European Union, uh, whereas Scotland voted very strongly in favour of staying in the uh, in the European Union and Northern Ireland also there was a majority, and we should not forget this, especially in the light of what is happening at the moment, voted in favour of staying in the EU. Here, allow me to connect to something that Gianfranco rightly said about the Scottish referendum of 2014. Again, let us not forget that probably one of the reasons why the Scottish people in 2014 voted in favour of remaining within the United Kingdom was that they feared that if they left the UK, they would also be leaving the European Union. Because as you all know, in international law, the successor state would have been the rest of the United Kingdom, and Scotland would have had to have reapplied for uh, membership, and this would have been problematic because of the position of Spain and other countries. Okay, Now, once we obtain that result on the 23rd of June uh, 2016, then we start seeing other rips. And, and the biggest of these is, of course, how to trigger Article 50, because let us, I repeat again, the referendum was not legally binding, so we, we had to trigger Article 50 of the, of the Lisbon Treaty. Ir irony of history drafted by a Scotsman, among other things, okay. But uh, lasciamo stare questo. <laughs> um, and here is what I uh, have termed and others have termed as a heterogony of means because the Brexiteers and those that were in favour of Brexit up until the 23rd of June uh, 2016 were putting all their emphasis on one of the pillars of the British constitutional system, i.e. parliamentary sovereignty or parliamentary supremacy. In a way, and one has to applaud the Brexiteers from this point of view, their, their uh, referendum campaign was much better than that of those who wanted to remain in the 
uh, in the European uh, Union because they were much more effective. The, the use of the word take back control in a certain sense was a synthesis of 40 years of debates about Britain's role in Europe and the effects that it would have on uh, parliamentary sovereignty. The critics of Britain entering the European uh, economic community, such as Enoch Powell, Tony Benn, uh, Douglas Jay, uh, and so on and so forth, okay, all underline the fact that by entering the common market, Britain would lose its parliamentary sovereignty and uh, the supremacy of its parliament. There was something different with respect to the parliaments of continental European countries, okay? Here in my book, I, I make various citations of Enoch Powell, who I have uh, no sympathies for politically, but that one cannot deny is, a, in a way, a symbol of, Brex of the Brexiteers, just as much as Jean Monnet can be considered a for those that are in favour of European integration. So what happens after the referendum? After the referendum, suddenly the Brexiteers want to sidestep Parliament, okay? And we have this whole discussion about uh, Theresa May, constitutionalist British and not only. We knew very well that the, the British government was taking a stance that didn't make sense because it was obvious that Article 50 had to be triggered by uh, the British Parliament because by leaving the European Union, uh, we were making changes to legislation. We, were, we would be amending, if not repealing, the European uh, Communities Act of 1972 and so on and so forth. So it was obvious that something like this had to be done uh, by Parliament and not by uh, the executive. Okay, And indeed, uh, this is what happens uh, because we have the uh, uh, Miller case and we have the decisions of the High Court and of the Supreme Court. Okay, and at that point, uh, Theresa May is forced to go through, is forced to go through Parliament, okay? Interesting to note that again, insistence by Theresa May on the fact that Parliament, the House of Commons, could not go against the will of the people. What? What do you mean can't, the, the Parliament can't go against the will of the people? What happened to parliamentary sovereignty? Again, question mark. And it's interesting to see that it's only the House of Lords, the unelected branch of the British Parliament, the unelected House of the British Parliament, that actually tries to make some modifications to the bill with which Article 50 is being uh, triggered by, to no avail, to no avail. Then another rip. Another rip happens after Article 50 has been, uh, has been triggered, when Theresa Bay, after promising that she would not uh, ask for an election, announces there's going to be an election on the 8th of June uh, 2017. Again, in my opinion, this is going at least very close to a rip, if not a action that was unconstitutional, I use this in inverted commas, because Theresa May had evidently forgot, or probably she hadn't forgotten, that back in 2011, the coalition government of Cameron and Clegg had approved the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which had taken the power to dissolve Parliament away from the government. Formally, it is the Queen that dissolves Parliament, we know very well, up until 2011, all the Prime Minister had to do was get into her or his Jaguar, go to Buckingham's Palace, ask the Queen to dissolve Parliament, that would happen. With the Fixed Term Parliament Act, this was no longer possible. So at the very least, disrespect on the part of Prime Minister May towards Parliament. Then we know what happens. Corbyn decides to vote in favour of the motion to dissolve parliament. We all thought that this would be a mistake. And then in actual fact, the 2017 elections proved to be a disaster for Theresa May because she loses that slender majority that she had. Maybe in the Q and A, we can talk a little bit more what, about why she made that choice because I think there is a historic example in the past that she was looking at. And this is where we have another problem. And that is, when Theresa May decides not to go for the idea of a, of a grand coalition or consocial uh, politics, John Frank was underlined the model, the British model, model is characterized by adversarial 
politics, but maybe this was a moment where it would have been a good idea to have involved everyone. No, she tries to hold on, and she does so by asking for the external support of the Democratic Unionist Party. Now, what's the big deal here? The big deal here is that we are not in the 1970s, where we've had in the past governments that have been supported by, uh, by the uh, by the unionists in Northern Ireland. We are in a post Good Friday agreement situation. And therefore, by having a British government that is supported only by the Democratic Unionist Party, we take away that impartiality that the British government should have on the basis of the Good Friday agreement. And this is an issue, by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, this is another problem that activating article and triggering article 50 poses because this is a unilateral in my opinion violation of the good friday agreement okay and i don't think enough emphasis has been put on this and even the uk supreme court i think probably for political reasons decided not to deal with this uh, very thorny issue but i remain of the opinion that britain's decision to unilaterally leave the European Union was a violation of that peace agreement. And unfortunately, and I do not say this with pleasure, if we look at the troubles that we've had in the last 12, 13 days in Northern Ireland, a lot of it is to do with uh, what happened in 2000. And of the Liberal Democratic Party of the UK, we know that the Liberal Democratic party was probably the most pro-EU, pro-Remain faction uh, in the British Parliament, especially considering the ambiguous, at most Brexiteer leanings of the Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. But the 2020 elections were um, pretty dismal for the Lib Dems, and the leader of the party, Joe Swinson, also lost her seat to the SNP. Um, uh, your slide, Professor Baldini, uh, talked about the possibility of the resurgence of the Lib Dem as a more classical liberal party, so more oriented towards free market, um, what can I say, to more right-wing liberal beliefs. Uh, how much is this feasible, feasible given the current poll numbers, and what ro role would the the liberal the liberal democrat stake in the current environment especially considering the um, incredible rise of the tories of the conservatives over the new labor leadership of uh, uh oh i forgot the name of what of the over the new labor labor leadership shall i take it now this question now okay yeah, thank you. I mean, this is an interesting this is an interesting question, of course, because the party indeed had a role as you know a stopper, and one could say vis-a-vis uh, -vis David Cameron in his first term as as, as prime minister in 2010, 20 to 2015. Uh, but then you know the party was also the most damaged force in the in the, in the shock that I mentioned before. So the coalition as a shock, you know, as an electoral shock because it was unprecedented after World War II. So the Lib Dems actually made a U-turn on tuition fees. They were damaged in the opinion of the electorate ever since. So they haven't recovered since then. Never for, don't forget that they got more than 20% of the vote in different elections in 2005 and 2010. And now they are in less than 10%. So they are still experiencing trouble in finding a new leadership, which would be uh, which has to be able to squeeze in, you know, between the, the Tories and the Labour Party. And of course, it's difficult to make any forecast for the next election, also because we don't know when these elections will take place, uh, considering also the, 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 the argument that uh, Justin was making on fixed term parliament act, which has been somehow, you know, uh, uh, um, taken down by the, the, by the unanimity of the two parties to go into a early election in 2017. So to conclude on this point, the party was undoubtedly the most pro-EU party since already several decades, but it still experiences a lot of trouble in finding a new image, the new capacity to be perceived by the electorate as, as a third force. So one of the trouble that Labour 
experienced also in 2019 was that it wasn't able to unite the remain front. So the Labour Party in itself was divided. This was somehow inevitable because the Labour Party had scored very well in seats which had voted for leave, especially the so-called seats of the, of the Red Wall of the north of England, which the party lost in great numbers in 2019. So to conclude, the idea of the Lib Dems being able to you know, rise back and uh, still fragment the system as they did from, uh, from the mid-90s until 2010 is still you know, uh, very long from, from, from now. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. I see the Justin Frosini is back. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we, we okay. can. And indeed, mm -hmm. now with the app, I can see you in a completely different format. So it must have been the way that I connected. I apologize for this problem. Okay. And well, in any case, very good to know for the next speakers. We will tell them to download the app, uh, Absolutely. which seems to work uh, much, much better. Thank you for that. I'm glad I, I'm, I'm glad I was a guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> Is there uh, any other question for uh, both uh, our our speakers, uh, either for Gianfranco Baldini or Justin Frosini from, from the audience? Uh, yes, I have one for Professor Baldini before we move on. And it's about the, the second slide that you had um, when we were you were discussing whether or not the UK was going to return to a stricter Westminster model. And I was a bit curious because I mean, you were talking about the votes uh, and how people have been and the voting numbers have changed. I think it jumped up to um, in the Brexit years, the, the voting numbers jumped. I don't remember the exact value, but I was curious as to your view on voter ID um, and strong party ID is perhaps maybe a more um, important indicator of where uh, the system is going, because I noticed that it stays quite low. I mean, you have 16, 15, 17, it doesn't change. You don't see a strong identification with these major parties as a result of this. You just see a sort of maybe a, a temporary, I think the the slogan was get Brexit done or whatever with, with Johnson. Uh, so perhaps I mean, to go as far as to suggest that a return to the Westminster model is possible without strong um, associations with the two major parties is is a bit of a jump. And just to contextualize that a little bit. I come from the American system where party identification is very strong. Like people identify as Democrats or Republicans, and that allows for very broad coalitions. I mean, I come from the South, and there's a lot of Democrats there who have fundamentally different beliefs than Democrats in, in California, for example, yet they still have the capacity to run a two-party system because of that. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on that as a strong indicator for the future trend. Uh, well, thank you very much for this question. It is, it is, of course, an important one, and I tried to stress in my presentation the importance of this element of party ID, which doesn't show any sign of recovery, as you said correctly. And and this is kind of important. I believe also that there is a role here in of distrust towards politics, which was very much fueled by the 2009 expenses crisis, which actually was another shock for the political system because we see we saw already before that some signs of the consolidation of the original and normal trust on which the Westminster system was based. But still, uh, polls after polls would keep telling us that people no longer identified in a stable way. Rather, what happened in the last year was that Brexit IDs were stronger than party IDs. So people, you could say normally, because a referendum, of course, polarizes. It's a binary choice. So you'd have to take one of those two. But still, you know, there are still uh, um, Brexit identities are still stronger than party identities. And there is no big sign of recovery, as I said. Not even, you know, um, Boris Johnson, who had a really successful election in 2019, was able to boost uh, a lot on these data, so to, to boost identification on his party. And so, Electorates throughout Europe are more volatile, and this is still very different from the U.S., where you only have, you know, a two a two party game, no matter what. I mean, you can have some maverick candidate at one presidential election and the other, uh, but you you would have a maverick candidate like Donald Trump entering the party, you know, and and getting the party if he wants to get a choice to be elected. In the UK, of course, the the, the institutional system, as Justin was saying before, is a parliamentary one, so you would have to 
uh, to align the all party data on the institutional lines on which the system is organized. So I don't see, and, and I didn't comment on my table the last, the very last row, which was on the tur on turnout. And again, here, research on turnout shows that it won't recover. I mean, this is, so, sorry, I put it another way. Uh, research on uh, uh, turnout shows that party ID is also important here because until more people would stably, uh, would, would identify it in a stable way on political parties, we would still have uh, turnout uh, rather low. And you see, it doesn't recover to the same levels as it did, as it was, you know, before 1970. And of course, one could even comment here, since also Justin was commenting this before, that the, that the Scottish referendum had more than 80% of turnout. And again, the Brexit referendum as a, as a turnout, which was much higher than any general election after 1992. So what we see is that people in the UK, very much like in other European system, although, you know, Germany is different and there are some differences in other countries, do use referendums and they believe in the instrument. Although we know as political scientists and as constitutional lawyers that there are troubles in the referendum as such, you know, as an instrument of change. But people, you know, of course, we should never underestimate the fact that people, that the majority of the people don't really care about politics. Or if they care, they do, you know, they are, in many ways, there are some, you know, very much, very few people who are very identified and very high intensity involved in politics. But the greatest majority of the people do take shortcuts. They take cues. And if you have a referendum, it's much easier to take a side than if you have a menu, of course, you know, in, in, a, in a general election. And if you see that coalitions can happen, like it was in 2010, you know, the game changes a bit. And if you see that Scotland can have a referendum on leaving the, uh, the country, things change again. And Brexit referendum as such, you know, which wasn't, uh, which wasn't conceivable until a few years ago, changed the, 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 the game again. So I won't see any return of the classic Westminster model system anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you. May I take uh, any additional uh, question addressed to any one of our, of our speakers? From the audience, Angela Carraro and then Angela Rossi. Please, uh, Alessandra, and the floor is yours. Sorry. Okay. Um, thank you. I have. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, wait. I ha okay. I have a question for uh, Professor Prozini. Uh, I actually have loads, but I'll stick to two. Um, so the first question is: What was the historic example you were mentioning when May called the snap election in 2017? And the second one is. Uh, is Brexit a constitutional moment for the UK? Will we have a written constitution uh, in a few years in the UK? Or, or a codified constitution as you specify? Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna get boxed by by Eduardo and Giuseppe for my for my disaster with the technical stuff today. Uh, on disaster, I mean. But okay, um, Alex, Alexander, I'm gonna answer your second question first, and very quickly, although we could elaborate a lot more. Um, I don't predict Britain and the United Kingdom codifying their constitution anytime soon. Uh, I don't think I think that is off the off the cards. On the contrary, there are a lot of signs, at least with the Johnson with the Johnson government, that uh, we want to go in uh, in an opposite direction. That there has been too much codification. I'm thinking of the Human Rights Act and 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 so on and so forth. And therefore, I don't think at the moment under the present government there will be any. Uh, codification of the British of the British Constitution. Coming to your first question, um, the example is uh, 1992 and the major uh, government of 1992. Let us just remember what happens in 1990-1992. Uh, 
1990, uh, the Thatcher government falls because of Europe. Okay, this is a very, very important uh, event in the sort of historical narration of what Brexit is all about. Okay, it's not the poll tax that brings Thatcher down, it's Europe. Okay, when she gives this speech, the famous speech that you can go and see on YouTube, no, no, no. Okay, what has happened? Cole has announced to the European Council that he intends to proceed with unification. Uh, the reaction is not particularly enthusiastic. At this point, Delors puts on the table the idea of accelerating with regard to creating the European Union. And this is something that Thatcher does not agree with. Thatcher, who was a, a supporter of the European economic community, let us not forget this, and, what, and played an important role in the drafting of the Single European Act of 1986. What she wanted was as large as possible an internal um, a free market, an internal market. What she didn't want, and we can see this in her Bruce speech of 1988, what she didn't want was an apparatus, as it were, being built on that, on that open space. Okay? And she didn't want a, uh, the creation of a, of, a, of a European Union. When she gives that speech, at this point, there is a break within the Conservative Party, which at the time was very Europhile. Well, of course, you all know that it was actually the, the Conservative Party that took Britain into Europe in uh, uh, 1972 after another, to use Gianfranco's expression, shock election result of 1970. Nobody expected Edward Heath to win the election of 1970. He did, and he took Britain into, into Europe. At the time, so in 1990, the majority in the Conservative Party wanted to continue with integration. Fat Thatcher is ousted. Uh, Major becomes uh, Prime Minister. In 1992, he uh, signs the Maastricht Treaty. He signs it, I, I can't remember the exact dates, I think February, March of uh, 1992. But then there is a general election in uh, uh, in that same year, in May, June of 1992, okay, Gianfranco underlined one of the most participated elections. There was a very, very high turnout, which is the reason why Major unexpectedly wins those elections. Everyone was forecasting a victory for the Labour Party under Neil Kinnock. At that point, what happens is that Major has w w wins the largest amount of popular vote, but he has a fairly small majority in the House of Commons, and he has to get the ratification of the Maastricht Treaty through. And this is where he has a terrible time, okay? You just have to read his autobiography. There's a chapter which is called The Bastards, excuse the expression, okay? Where he talks about the Maastricht rebels, okay? That make his life a misery. Who are the Maastricht rebels? The Maastricht rebels are the Thatcherites, that basically consider what happens in the, at the end of 1990 as nothing less than a coup d'etat against Mrs. Thatcher. And they become the basis, the core for the anti-federalist movement and then the creation of, of the United Kingdom Independence Party. So where is the comparison with what happens in 2017? Mrs. May knows very well that she still has in 2017 a Conservative Party that is a result of the elections of 2015. The majority, probably the majority of the members of the Conservative Party are still in favour of staying in the EU. And she realises after the problems of even triggering Article 50 that she could end up in a similar situation to Major. And that's the reason why she calls, calls an election. Of course, it's a boomerang because not only does she not get a larger majority than she thought she would obtain, but she actually loses her majority. So that I am pretty certain that she was looking at that historical experience and thinking, I don't want to go down that road. You read, and I do this in my book, actually, if you read some of the statements made by John Major in 1992, when he describes the divisions within his party, and you you just take the words, you would think it was Theresa May talking in 2018-2019. Thank you. I uh, remember there was a question from Angela Rossi, who is uh, next in line. Thank you. 
thank you this is right well um to be honest there were two but one just found the answer uh, and i was also interested in in knowing more about the, the historical fact you were mentioning but uh, going to my second question that may be a very obvious obvious one and it and it is related uh, to the first presentation so to mr baldini mm. I, I assert first that, that my background is a legal one, so I, it is the very first time for me that I'm, I get in touch with more um, political science matters. And uh, I am not sure to have understood correctly what is meant in your second slide uh, with plurality, with, with this concept, because I heard you commenting on that. And I, I would like to, 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 to hear you saying something more, if there is some definition, if there is something that I'm missing as a concept that is maybe more important than, than what I, I got so far. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, sure. Uh, apologies for, you know, taking for granted things that maybe I shouldn't have. Uh, so the plurality system is the same as the first past the post. So it's the electoral system whereby British voters go to the polls and in each of the 650 constituency, the candidates who gets most votes in each of them is elected into parliament. So that is the electoral system. You know, it was applied already in the back in the 13th century when parliament was first convened. It became more and more used as time went by and it became the standard procedure in 1948, in which all the seats of the UK were elected via this system. So it's what we have in the Italian system for 36% of the seats in the current Italian electoral law, Rosato law, okay? So it's a strong electoral system to use Giovanni Sartori's words, uh, because as you understand it, you know, unless you have, unless you get become first in, in a competition in one of these, you know, constituency in which the, 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 uh, the territory of the UK is divided, you basically lose everything. So this is also the meaning of first past the post. If you get over the post, you become first, you get the seat. Otherwise, you lose everything. So there was an election back in 1983, correct me, Justin, if I'm wrong, where the Liberal Party got 23% of the votes and they only got like 5 or 6% of the seats. So it's a very punitive system for parties which have a, a vote which is scattered around the country rather than, you know, um, solidly... Uh, in a specific part of the territory that makes for that party possible to gain a seat. And again, this was the case in 2015, when UKIP got 12.6 or something percent of the votes, and they only gained one seat, because it was a former, former conservative MP who actually joined the party at the time in which the party was become very successful, and it got the most votes in the European Parliament election. So when I mentioned the European Parliament election, Never forget this importance that you have plurality system now in the UK only or mainly for the general election and for some local elections, okay, which will take place in just a few days from today, next month, I believe, uh, in local election. But you have proportional representation for electing the European Parliament from 2000, sorry, from 1999 until 2019, which were the last European election for the UK, you know, which the year after left the EU, and you have mixed system for both uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. In this mixed system, you have a, a plurality component, and you also have a PR component, proportional representation. And of course, this makes the challenge of small parties much easier, because the threshold of representation goes down. But until plurality survives, and I agree with Justin that there is no sign of major parties wanting to, you know, to give up on plurality because it's their major defense vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, challenger parties. And until plurality survives, and again, plurality in the, in, U, in the EU is only applied in the UK, it's also applied in the US, in other systems around the world, former colonies of the UK, but still, until that applies, it's the major defense for the parties of the establishment. And so it's a key component of the Westminster system as such, and it's somehow also the key component. Some people would talk about majoritarian democracy, you know, by taking majoritarian from the name of the electoral system. I hope I've clarified a bit. Yes, very clear. Thank you. Could I could I add something just to what Gianfranco was 
was saying. Um, I want to be provocative here. Um, I think what happens when the European uh, Union obliges all the countries in the EU to adopt proportional representation is one of those cases of excessive harmonization that actually is one of the root causes of of Brexit. Okay, I'm I'm not a believer in in one uh, trying to explain things with one one cause. Okay, so there is a plurality of, of of reasons why Brexit happened, but undoubtedly by introducing, as Gianfranco has rightly underlined, proportional representation, or rather obliging Britain to adopt proportional representation for uh, the European parliamentary elections. This opens the space. Paradoxically, for the anti-EU uh, uh, EU parties, and this is this is where we start seeing changes in the political system. And there's just another little thing that I would that I would add. I think Gianfranco does very well to use the expression plurality because that is the best way of explaining the system. Because the truth of the matter is that first past the post, if you think about it, is actually confusing and is a bad name for the system because there is no post. You don't reach a post. If you think about it in terms of a threshold, there isn't one. You could, as long as you've got the plurality of the seats in that constituency, you win. Okay, there isn't a minimum number of votes that you have to uh, that you have to obtain. Like Sorry, in the French one. Yeah. Which you have in the French one on the other side. Exactly, exactly. Well, thanks. Uh, let's take a, another round of questions since we are touching upon several different issues. And of course, uh, uh, I would urge the students to exploit our guests as they have a very broad knowledge of the British theme and also beyond what they've been presenting in their 20 minutes. Uh, uh, I'm sure they can address also some of the uh, puzzles or, or points that were touched upon in this session and beyond. Uh, Francesco Faieta. Uh, I have a question for Professor Frosini because um, he just said that uh, um, for him one of the problems uh, where the, um, uh, the EU uh, obliged the United Kingdom to adopt the, um, a different system, no? the proportional system for the European election. Professor, don't you believe that maybe if um, there was like um, a stronger force um, of the European, the European Union, like um, a constitution no? that uh, was a project but was suspended in 2007, I think, because of the referendum in France. Don't you think that uh, if there was something stronger uh, between uh, European Union and UK, maybe that things can could be different today? Okay, the quick answer to that question, this is an interesting counterfactual, Francesco. The quick answer to the question is, yes, of course, there are, there are various moments. This is stuff that is studied also by historians, political scientists. There are defining moments and you, you get into these situations where you could sort of talk about sliding doors or forks in the road where you could go one way or, uh, or, uh, uh, or another. Uh, let me elaborate on what I said about uh, 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 introducing proportional representation for the uh, part of the European parliamentary elections. I criticize this as a Europhile because having uh, proportional representation, in my opinion, and there may be people here that don't agree with what I'm about to say, was actually a way of weakening the role of the European Parliament. Because if we have uh, other systems, and we and we render the European Parliament more political, then we start having this idea that the European Commission is based on a true and proper relationship of confidence with uh, the uh, the European Parliament. And I think this is this is something that we we suffer from still to still still today. So it's not just a problem of not respecting the diversity of the different countries that compose the European Union, which I think is important because as a Europhile, I believe in an idea of unity within an idea of diversity. I think you can combine the, by, by the, the, the two, but I think these are things that have weakened uh, the European Union over time. The Constitution. 
In my opinion, again, and I know I'm going to find some people that do not agree with what I'm saying. We get into by when we get to the beginning of the new millennium, we get into an, an excessive euro enthusiasm. Okay, in my opinion, I get a repeat. I say this as a Europhile. The secret of European integration up until that moment had been incremental, slow steps forward. All of a sudden, we start with the Charter of Nice, and then we start talking about adopting a constitution. But the way that we went about drafting that constitution, the person that had written the most on this is Giuseppe Martinico, and I think there's also Professor Deledon here. They can say a lot more about this. But uh, the, that whole process was far too much top down. You don't go about uh, codifying a constitution in that way. And it was probably inevitable that we would have the, to use the metaphor that E.H. Carr uses. We were going to have a car crash, and that we were going to end up with the with referendums saying no in in uh, the Netherlands and France because the the European people had not been prepared for all of this and there hadn't been a proper debate plus the fact that all of this was combined together with the big enlargement in my opinion and I know I'm saying something controversial but in my opinion if the if you're going to draft that constitution it should have been drafted by the 15 members at the time and then you open up for enlargement okay to have mixed everything together i think that john franco said that the Becker was talking about bundling earlier okay to bundle everything up like that was in my opinion a second and then of course there's the euro okay which okay now we're in a situation where we have to defend the euro, whatever it takes, according to our present Prime Minister Draghi. Now that we have it as a Europhile, I say that we need to keep it. But again, maybe that was another process that ended up being being top down. Maybe, you know, Britain also hesitated and the Europhiles in the 2000s hesitated. Tony Blair could have done more. Tony Blair led a government that was very europhile and it had the majority of the support of the british people at the time and your and tony blair was very popular at the time even in the rest of europe if he'd taken that further step probably the european issue the european question would have been resolved there would that have been a good thing for the uk or a bad thing with what happened afterwards we don't know but probably we would not have had the referendum in 2016 had these issues been addressed back in the first decade of the millennium well, thanks. Uh, I see the several hands have been raised, which means uh, I'm going to take up a few questions for our speakers uh, together, and then we will see who's going to uh, address them, maybe probably both uh, uh, speakers. Um, I start with Christian Capoferro. Yes, I have a question for Professor Frosini about something he mentioned before uh, with Scotland um, has the possibility of Scotland of leaving the UK and then starting a process of application for the EU. And uh, I would like to ask uh, your opinion about the feasibility of this process, also given the fact, as you mentioned, of the membership of some countries such as Spain that are uh, kind of dealing everyday problems with separatists in their countries, and how would they see uh, this process? And in, in in uh, and I'll close the question, but like in a um, in a more complex uh, way. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Julia Tavora. Yes, I also have a question for Professor Frosini, and it's also regarding uh, Scotland. I wanted to ask if. Um, was the Scottish Parliament supposed to be consulted about the Brexit procedure by Westminster Parliament? And because I'm referring to, for example, a Sewell Convention and the Scotland Act, because between the British government and the British Parliament, uh, the last word was Parliament's one. But um, what about uh, the Scottish Parliament? Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Matteo Romagnoli. Thanks. I have a question for the Professor Baldini uh, about the, the uh, if there is uh, this uh, strong majority electoral system, uh, 
uh, which could be the, sp the institutional space for the politicization of the Brexit, post-Brexit issues, which uh, you mentioned uh, in, your, in your talk. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, let's go first uh, with maybe Professor Frosini, who's got two questions, and then we move on to Gianfranco Baldini. Okay. Um, so, Christian, the issue, the issue of Scotland. The, the first very important thing to underline is that the situation in 2014 was one thing. The situation today in 2021 is, is very different. Um, as I underlined in my uh, <laughs> interrupted talk, my fault, um, it, I believe that one of the two elements, the other was certainly economic, but one of the two elements that led to the victory of those that wanted to stay in the Union of the United Kingdom uh, was the fact that Scotland uh, feared that it would have problems being able to re-enter the European Union, because as you underlined, other countries that have problems with secessionist movements would have maybe posed a veto. Today, I am not so sure that that uh, would happen. Um, obviously, this is just a bit, it's very different, difficult to forecast on, on what might happen in the future. But today, I think a Scotland that decided to leave the United Kingdom mainly because it wants to return to the European Union would be seen very very favorably by the 27 members of the of the EU including those countries that do have problems with possible uh, secessionist movements and so on and so forth um but we cannot be sure that that independence would win because uh the uh, the opinion polls show it as being very close. We will have to see what happens in the in the uh, uh, in the elections and Scottish parliamentary elections in uh, uh, in May. Uh, certainly, if the Scottish National Party uh, wins an overall majority uh, in the Scottish Parliament, we have a problem on our hands because obviously the SNP has said that it wants to hold a a second referendum on independence, but we should not forget the fact that uh, this is a constitutional matter and the constitution is one of the reserved subject matters uh, with, regard to, with regard to devolution. If we look at the Scotland Act of 1998, one of the subject matters that remains reserved to Westminster is the constitution. What does this mean in more simple terms? It means that there has to be an agreement between the British government and the Scottish government for there to be another referendum. And that's what happened in 2014. We had the so-called Edinburgh Agreement. Cameron decided to give the Scottish people the chance to hold the referendum. But why did he do this? This is where uh, law and politics overlap with one another, because Cameron was convinced that he could win that referendum and that the majority of the Scottish people would say no to independence. And he won it. OK, and that's why he then had the referendum on Brexit, thinking he could win again, unfortunately. He did. He didn't. So it's a it's a difficult situation. I've I've almost defined it for the Scottish people a no win situation. Very frustrating. You think that them there are the, the 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 majority of the Scottish people said no to independence, and now they find themselves not through their own will outside the European Union. Uh, so it 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 will be. I think a lot will depend on the result of the parliamentary elections in May. Uh, because that could create a political and maybe ultimately a constitutional clash. Julia, you're absolutely right. I don't want to uh, dis disregard your 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 question because it's 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 a very important one. Uh, but the Seal Convention, from a legal point of view, uh, does not prevail over parliamentary sovereignty. Our friend comes back into into play again. Okay, this is where you could say. That parliamentary sovereignty still has an importance, despite my theory that we are sh we have shifted towards a form of sovereignty of the people, because it's a convention. Uh, it's at the end of the day, basically, allow me to simplify to them to a maximum: a question of political courtesy on the part of the Westminster 
Parliament to ask Scotland what they think and whether they will allow Westminster to 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 legislate because they are are they are their subject matters that are in part reserved to the Scottish Parliament. But at the end of the day, the, the Westminster Parliament can legislate, and it would mean de facto an amendment to the uh, distribution or allocation of subject matters between Scotland and uh, the United Kingdom. The whole issue is very problematic, however, and, and the fact that it is with Brexit, this is another example of how things have got very tense. It's only with Brexit that we've had uh, Sewell motions that have been defeated, i.e. Scotland saying no. And the same same also happened, happened in Wales. But from a legal, a legal point of view, it's parliamentary sovereignty that prevails. From a political point of view, though, this is an issue. It's a problem. And it's where we see, again, a clash between Westminster and Holyrood. Um, okay, so um, the problem is that I agree too much with Justin. This happens to us every time we meet. Yeah, I know we don't. <laughs> no, I mean, but uh, luckily enough, the question posed to me was on a different side. So I take uh, I take uh, Matteo's question as an important one because, of course, uh, the my suggestion also in my second slide of putting together party, social, and institutional elements chimes again with Justin's argument that. We always have to consider a multiplicity of, of causes and factors in explaining political and, and constitutional matters as well. And in this in this case, the point it, which I would like to make is that, of course, the institutional rules are very important uh, ultimately to you know constrain uh, changes. But the politicization of the European issues took place in a in a plurality environment. So. What happens, and I have some quotation also in my chapter for the forthcoming book with Eduardo and Manuele, is that Nigel Farage declared himself that once people understand that you have a chance to win a seat, they understand that voting for you is not a wasted vote. Okay, so this is important. And the UKIP, at, I told you before, in, back in 2015, got 12.6% of the vote. It only got one seat. But it was the second most voted party, as far as I remember, in 120 seats, which meant that in, you know, had the 2016 referendum not happened, okay, and, and, and therefore UKIP, uh, you know, had the same meaning of 2015, it could have got many, many seats in 2017. Of course, having the referendum happen, the same, you know, raison d'etre for UKIP was basically gone, so the party was there, but Nigel Farage was no longer leader, and the idea of the party being a single issue party was basically gone in the electorate under the assumptions that Brexit was already done back in 2015, 17, which, as Giuseppe has shown us before, was not the case because it was only the case of triggering the Article 50 and the long process which started after that. So, to go back to my point, the, the, the point is that to have a politicization of the European issue again in the UK, it would have to happen, you know, important things such as, you know, big strike of the of the fishermen who are unhappy with the quotas of the fishing system, you know, being changed in five years' time, if I remember well, or other things which are not under the radar now or which are impossible to foresee. But this doesn't mean that the possible for the future politicization of the European issue might happen again. Of course, the big question of being out, you know, goes against this possibility. But, you know, who knows that the maverick leader will come after Johnson doesn't succeed in the next years. And this maverick leader says, basically, they have stolen us Brexit. And uh, this hasn't meant what we wanted to have, you know, for our future, for our trade relationship, for our future as a system, for our global Britain. So, you know, politics is made of rhetoric, and we know that, you know, we have had successful leaders in the recent past, you know, making up arguments or making up things that weren't basically true in, in many ways. So it's not impossible. I would see it as quite remote as things stand now, but it, it, we can't rule it out. I hope well, I thanks again. 
I guess so. It's not to me to to say, but uh, uh, I'll I'll uh, take the chance uh, since I've I've jumped in to collect uh, some of the questions. Since I see uh, our participants have uh, plenty of questions, and that's uh, great uh, to to see. Uh, I do see the Christian uh, uh, is is uh, uh, still there with his hand raised, but that may be simply uh, because yes. Uh, no, my I um, have another question which arises from the the answer I received. Okay, I'll put you I'll put you next yes. in the line. I start with Lavinia, who's been uh, 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 waiting, and then Adam. Okay, um, I think maybe Adam was before me. It doesn't matter. I click them oh. together. Uh, please okay. go on, and then uh, Adam will forgive us. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, I just uh, have a quest, uh, question for Professor Frosini, uh, but um, actually even for um, for Professor Baldini. Um, I think the um, that the Article Fifty um, has demonstrated its um, inefficiency um, in since it's a very com complex agreement that uh, has to um, uh, to be concluded in. Uh, um, um, you know, withdrawal from the U uh, from the U uh, from the U uh, European Union. So, um, do you think that maybe um, it will make sense to extend like the the, the two year period uh, of uh, progression um, to um, to gain a, a like. Um, a more stable solution, um, like uh, I think, uh, uh, as you um, said, Professor Prosini, um, the UK, um, especially the UK, is like a, a, a multinational uh, country. So there are a lot of interest, and maybe more time um, for this complex, uh, difficult um, agreement. It would add to uh, balance all this interest in this country. Do you think it would be? Mm, it would be better to to extend this period to uh, to modify this article. Adam, uh, this this is for both of you, um, but it's a response to Professor Frozzini more and your more controversial claim. I think it was in response to I think Federico on uh, basically Europe going too fast. Um, and the enlargement issue, the constitution issue. Millennium. And I'm curious as to your perspectives on, because a little bit more context on this. I'm in international relations, and I usually come at it, at it from a more constructivist perspective. So identity first, creations of identity, and then that being basically causal. So whenever I look at the British people, let's say, um, I tend to, to be a little bit more struck with the uniqueness of, I mean, first off, their system in the legal system that we're talking about is, is particularly unique um, in the European model, but then also this identity tied to sovereignty that perhaps may be a little bit stronger than on the continent, and even an identity that's based in not being European to a certain extent, being special, being this special island, particularly after the Second World War. So I'm just curious as to if... I mean, this is another very controversial point, but I'd like your opinions on it as to if perhaps the United Kingdom is, you know, almost a necessary casualty in a certain way, if Europe is indeed looking to eventually go towards a more integrated union with a constitution. For both, I'd love to hear both your opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Christian, if you want to have a brief follow up on uh, your question. Before. Yes, mine is just a kind of curiosity more than a question. Um, you were mentioning the um, uh, uh, Scottish Nationalist Party, which uh, I don't know. And uh, uh, what I was curious about is that um, in unlike uh, the usual way we see National Party in Italy, um, I was wondering if like the Scottish Nationalist Party is uh, uh, in favor of uh, membership to the EU, uh, since we are like used to see nationalist party um, in a um, in a strong opposition to the EU membership of Italy. That was a kind of curiosity more than a question. Thank you for both of the speakers. I think it's a suitable question. 
Okay, so it's back uh, uh, to we're back to the speakers. Uh, shall we uh, have uh, Gianfranco first, maybe, since to invert the order? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, if you want, I can take this question directly, which is more political uh, in a way. And the SMB, of course, is is a different party from uh, the Lega in Italy or the Front National or the Alternative for Deutschland. Because the context is different, it's very different because it was, you know, it used to be uh, more Eurosceptical in uh, Eurosceptic in the 1970s when it first got many votes in the 1974 elections. Uh, so just the year before the, the, the 1975 uh, uh, EEC referendum took place, uh, then it turned more uh, more Europhile. Also because the party, you know, has changed. Uh, um, as a result of the change of the Labour Party, which moved centre stage with Tony Blair, and and uh, the SNP basically uh, thrived on a left wing platform uh, for Scotland, saying that the Labour Party had uh, given up uh, its uh, socialist credentials by you know joining the neoliberal economy and neoliberal model in the 1990s with Tony Blair, and so. The, the Labour Party became very unsuccessful and unpopular in Scotland, also because the SNP was able to play the nationalist card together with the welfare card, in a way. So it was able to have both cards in its program. And therefore, the party has always been quite more Europhile than other nationalist parties around Europe. Um, I, I leave it to Justin to take uh, Adam questions, and then if you want, I come back. Okay, I'll, I'll start with Lavinia's question, which I think is a really, really interesting question, uh, to which I have two answers. Um, one, is, one is the answer of a lawyer, and one is the answer of, well, let's put it this way, a non-lawyer. The answer is a lawyer. I absolutely agree with you, Lavinia. Yes, the period, the transition period should be much longer because it is evident that when you have a country like the United Kingdom that has been part of the, of the European Economic Community slash European Union for over uh, for nearly, what was it, almost 50 years, it's obvious that you can't just from one day to the next uh, leave. Okay, it's complicated, in particular from a legal point of view, because uh, there is such an entanglement in terms of sources of law, rules, and so on and so forth, that it, it really is a, a complicated affair. So logically, from a legal point of view, the transition period should be longer. But if I answer as man on the street or looking at from a more political point of view, God forbid, God forbid, because I think the reason why Johnson won with such a massive majority in 2019 was not, and I don't know what Gianfranco and the others think about this, not because suddenly there was a massive conversion of British people towards Brexit, but if, if we look at the if we look at the results, the country is still split. If we look at it in terms of the votes that go to the different parties, Gianfranco can say a lot more about this because he's he studies these electoral fluxes and so on. But it, it, the win for Johnson is basically because he comes at the right time. He, le he, he leaves Theresa May to fry in the pan for as long as possible. Then he comes and he is Mr. Fix-It. We're going to get, we're gonna get uh, Brexit done. And I think there are a lot of people that voted for, for, for Johnson because they didn't know what the Labour Party was representing. It wasn't clear what their what their message was, and they knew that Johnson would get this done because people were just fed up of the whole issue of Brexit and didn't want to hear any more about it. And and I know that's not a very for for someone that's a lawyer that's not a legal answer to the question, but we can't ignore that aspect. The way that it all went on and on, and people were saying, "Well, do we vote in 2016? How how come it took us?" four years to leave the European Union. So uh, I don't have an answer. They, they clash with one another. Logically and legally, we'd, we'd need more time. But from if we look at the experience of Britain, I don't think we should. Probably we should let people should leave immediately. 
The point is that it's not so easy to leave the European Union, but I, had, I, won't, I won't elaborate further. Um, Adam, you're absolutely right. This is, this is one of the, of the many causes. Uh, there are some that say that there should never have been the enlargement to the United Kingdom in the first place. If de Gaulle had not resigned and then passed away in 1970, probably Britain would have, wouldn't have entered even in 1970. Maybe they wouldn't have entered if, if Heath had have lost the elections because Wilson had a, had a party that was split on the issue. Okay, here we can, we can bring up all the famous phrases from Churchill who says, we are with you, but we are not one of you. The whole thing about the fog, fog in the channel, the continent is is isolated so the idea that the the british are something different from from europe is probably an element of identity but allow me if i if i can to to cite from a speech that enoch powell the probably the the, the uh, sort of leader of the of the of the brexiteers and of the euro skeptics in a speech that he gave in lyon speaking in french by the way he was a, quite a linguist take parliament out of the history of england and that history itself becomes insignificant entire lifetimes of study would not be enough to explain why we have reached this point but the fact is that the british nation cannot see itself other than through its own parliament this means that parliamentary sovereignty represents something different for us from what parliamentary assemblies do for you now you may agree or not agree, but this is Powell talking to a French audience and saying, look, we are we are different. So in a way, OK, long winded answer to your question, Adam. Yeah, probably there is a different identity. And in a way, uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of British, not all British, especially the older generations, not so much the younger generations. Don't feel that they are European. OK, and that Europe is something different to 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 the UK. And that certainly played an important role in the Brexit referendum and the victory of Brexit in 2016. All right, uh, we're great getting towards the last uh, part of our round table. Uh, we have perhaps time for a last uh, round of questions. Uh, I will also uh, at this stage invite uh, uh, Giuseppe Martinico, Giacomo delle Donne, if they have any comment or question to jump in. Uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 all participants are uh, very welcome to ask uh, any further question that they may, they may have. But I think uh, 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 this may be the last uh, or the one before the last round of questions, depending on how many questions uh, there are. So please, uh, if there is any further um, uh, question or comment, uh, uh, I see uh, perhaps uh, uh, a, a N raised, but there is a light in the background, so I barely see. Yes, I do yes. see it. Uh, uh, yes, so please, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Antonio. Uh, is there anyone else? So I, I collect a few questions before uh, uh, giving the floor to, to our speakers. Yes, uh, I do see Alessandra uh, there. So Antonio first, Alessandra second. Any last uh, question? All right, so let's go with Antonio first and Alessandra second. Yeah, I wanted to ask to Professor Baldini in particular about the uh, the leadership of Keir Starmer as the new Secretary General of the Labour Party. And now it may possibly signal a turn uh, to those ideas which are usually called Blue Labour, generally a combination of British uh, exceptionalism, uh, British patriotism, conservative social values, but with a left-wing economical agenda. Alessandra. Uh, okay, uh, since there is no one else, um, I'll ask two questions again. And the first one is related to uh, my colleague's one. Uh, that is uh, perhaps for Professor Baldini. So the Labour Party has underwent a reinvention, as someone else called it, from socialism to neoliberalism. 
Uh, and I think this reinvention went hand in hand with the development of European integration. Uh, so does Brexit means that the socialist stances within the Labour Party, which were um, represented perhaps by Jeremy Corbyn in 2016, will they re-emerge? Uh, will the Labour Party become more close to its socialist roots? Um, and that's the first question. Second question is for um, more on, on parliamentary sovereignty, so perhaps for Professor Prozzini. Uh, is parliamentary sovereignty the sovereignty of the House of Commons? Because I was thinking that when, uh, before 2005 or 2009, there was no Supreme Court, independent Supreme Court in the United Kingdom, uh, and the Supreme Judicial Authority rested on the law lords, so on Parliament. So this whole thing of the supremacy of EU law was actually a problem if the Supreme of a Judicial Authority was in Parliament. Did it infringe parliamentary supremacy or only the supremacy of the House of Commons? That's it. Thank you. Whoever wants to go first, uh, replying to, to these questions, uh, really uh, up to, to you. Justin, please. Okay. Um, really good question, Alessandra. Really good question. It goes to the core of uh, of the British constitutional uh, constitutional system. Um, there are there are kind of sub questions in in your in your in your question. So uh, European uh, European Union law. Okay. There were again. I'm not going to list them for the umpteenth team's time, but there were various scholars, politicians, and so on that were convinced that if Britain entered the European Economic Community, this would be the end of parliamentary uh, sovereignty. Okay, uh, because at that point you would have a external body legislating also for uh, the United Kingdom. Now, the counter argument, the counter argument that personally I would use. I think Beppe, uh, Professor Deledonne, and so on, okay, just to cite the constitutionalist, but I'm sure also Gianfranco agrees with this, is that it was a choice that was made by the British Parliament to enter the European economic uh, community. And we may like it or not, it was then a decision of the British Parliament in 2017 to trigger Article 50. In my opinion, this safeguards the concept of of parliamentary sovereignty uh, within the british within the british system now where is where where is the core of this parliamentary sovereignty uh, it is in a parliament that is a bicameral parliament and we should not forget this i am sick and tired of seeing articles especially in newspapers and so on and so forth that talk about Britain having a monocameral system. This is not true. This is not true. Britain has a imperfect bicameral system. It's not the so-called perfect bicameral system, the clarified bicameral system that Italy has, although uh, we can all tell you that what we are seeing even in Italy is what the Italians call a monocameralismo di fatto, but that's another that's another topic, okay? Britain has, has two Houses of Parliament, and the House of Lords plays an important role. It's unelected. It, it is, yeah, it's certainly very unusual. It's one of those strange things that characterises the British system. Adam is absolutely right. Britain has some strange stuff to have this, this uh, House of Lords, where there are also four archbishops of the, of the Anglican Church and so on and so forth. It's all very peculiar. But... Allow me to say something in favour of this unelected House. Often, there is a group of about 70, 80 Lords who are legal experts, great drafters of legislation, and because they are not dictated to by partisan politics, they often improve the legislation that is, that is, that is uh, finally approved by the, by the, by the British Parliament. Ultimately, however, the last say is in the hands of the House of Commons. And if you if you want to look at it this from, from this point of view, ultimately the supremacy is in the House of Commons. United Kingdom um, uh, Supreme Court. From a certain point of view, Alessandra, allow me to use this. I want to simplify just to make you laugh. At. 
when the House of Lords, the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords became the UK Supreme Court, really all it was was a transferring of those judges to the other side of Parliament Square into Middlesex Palace, okay? Because initially the functions that were exercised were, uh, were the same. However, since then, and in particular because of Brexit, Miller 1, Miller 2, but it was already happening previously. We just have to think of the words of of, uh, of Lady Hale, who went on to become president of the of the Supreme Court, began to talk about the Supreme Court acting like a constitutional court. The the the, the, the Supreme Court is beginning to look like something similar to a to a, a constitutional court, but we must be very careful. It doesn't have what the, the Supreme Court in the United States has. We still don't have judicial review. Of, of legislation. And quite frankly, and this is kind of connected to a question I got earlier, I don't think we're going to get that anytime soon. On the contrary, Johnson is, is trying to reform the system and even judicial review of administrative action is being, is being limited. Okay, so that, I'll stop there because I could continue, but that's the answer to that question. Okay, then I think uh, I think it was both Antonio and Alessandra to ask a question on on labor leadership, which is again not easy to answer because you know uh, <laughs> Keir Starmer just got one year of his leadership a few days ago last week, if I remember well, and you know if you look back at his promises in his inaugural speech a year ago, he was basically saying that two things that he wanted to unite the party back. And that uh, basically Jeremy Corbyn was a good pal, a good friend, and uh, and so he wanted to, you know, kind of square the route, which 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 by the circle, which wasn't never going to be easy. And uh, of course, he has shown some competence, I believe. Uh, but he, if you look at uh, surveys and the opinion polls uh, since January, he has started to be criticised by the electorate. Uh, in many ways, and so even if Johnson had the trouble times last year with the start of the pandemic a year ago, he has somehow recovered, and it's still very difficult to see. Also, because we don't know when the next election will take place. Also, because of the troubles of the external parliament act, you know, which can theoretically be you know circumvented in one way or the other, and so it is kind of difficult to end up on a, on a clear note on where and uh, whether. Some socialist elements will come back in the labor platform. I would rather say no more than yes. Uh, but you know, he has to kind of um, uh, uh, run into a difficult uh, path of taking, you know, of keeping together many uh, voters who were very much mobilized by by Corbyn leadership uh, in the last years, and at the same time uh, remember the cruel rules of the plurality system, on which I've insisted a lot today. And those cruel rules, uh, you know, would bring us all to uh, perceive and understand the 2017 general election as a very peculiar one, in which the Brexit game was not played because Corbyn had agreed on the uh, triggering of Article 50, which took place just a few weeks before. So we should always remember that this, this, uh, these elections were very peculiar. And... Uh, it shouldn't be normalized as many enthusiasts of Corbyn's have done, I think, in Italy too. And so it was always going to be a very peculiar uh, election, you know. Uh, that, and, and, and indeed, if you compare that with 2019 general election, you saw we all saw how much Corbyn lost in just two and a half years, you know, from the previous election. So I, I'm afraid I don't have a definitive question, even because I think it would be unsincere and a bit, you know, brave to give. A different answer at the stage on on labor parties uh, uh, next platform so to speak thank you professor well, thanks thanks very much indeed uh, i think uh, uh, we may have reached uh, uh, the end of this uh, uh, long session uh, since we did start at four uh, well First of all, I'd like to uh, thank our speakers, uh, Gianfranco Baldini, Justin Prosini, for the many different insights they have provided on British politics, which used to be quite boring uh, a long time ago. Uh, now you see how much drama there is in British politics, uh, and indeed there is nothing, uh, it has nothing to envy uh, 
uh, when looking at Italian politics. Uh, I did use the label of Italianization. It really seems that there is drama for the Conservative, the Labour on Brexit, for Parliament, on, on, in elections. It really is, is exciting and it's an exciting moment to, to study and research. Um, having said that, and having thanked once more our speakers, uh, we will see uh, uh, each other again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock uh, when we turn the table around and we move from British politics and Brexit onto EU politics and Brexit, starting with the Commission and the European Council. So we'll be talking uh, about the very exact uh, topic, the very same topic, but focusing on the other side of the table, the European Union. So thanks very much again. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you for the participate for the participation and very stimulating yeah. discussion. Ciao. Yeah, it was great. It was Thank great you very much. I apologize year. again for the technical problems I had. <laughs> great meeting Thanks you, you guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Very much Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. See you. See you tomorrow then. Bye. Bye. See you. Ciao a tutti. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Arrivederci. Thank you. Bye bye, thank you. Chiudo la corretto? Io penso proprio di sì, Giacomo, e visto che abbiamo concluso la giornata. E, grazie. Insomma, grazie mille a te per tutto e ci vediamo domani. A domattina. Ciao, a presto, ciao, ciao. arrivederci, ciao Giacomo. Ciao, ciao.